All right. So about uh, 56 of you uh, expressed an interest in this topic. So today's lecture will be focused on data warehousing. Um, since there are fewer than 56 of you here, I'm going to first talk about a couple of other things while people kind of uh, filter in. So uh, first thing, uh, several people, uh, as several people noticed on the forum, uh, the JDBM2 serialization mechanisms are a little bit, uh, are not quite as uh, extensive as we'd originally thought. Um, so concretely, several people noticed a uh, not quite bug, but uh, incompleteness in JDBM2. And uh, this is something that is uh, not necessarily a, a showstopper, but it's something that you should be aware of. Uh, so concretely, I mentioned in my last uh, video that uh, you could use a custom serializer method in order to create um, to create a kind of a more compact representation uh, for the tuples that you'd be uh, storing in your indexes. Uh, one case where we've disco since discovered uh, that this cannot be used is in secondary indexes. Uh, so concretely, uh, a primary index you can think of as a mapping, a one-to-one -one mapping from a key to a set, uh, sorry, a key to a single tuple. And uh, you can think of a secondary index, uh, again, as, as concretely, a mapping from a single key to a single set of keys. Now, the problem is essentially the uh, JDBM2 code uh, does not have a uh, effective way of serializing uh, sets of keys. So uh, essentially, there's no way to assign this kind of uh, serializer for your secondary index. Um, now, there's a, a number of different workarounds. Uh, here are a couple uh, that I'll describe shortly. Uh, there are many more. Uh, this, these are just kind of the three that come to mind immediately. Uh, so the, the first potential thing that you can do is simply ignore secondary indexes. Um, this is easy, but it doesn't necessarily lead to uh, good performance, though your mileage may vary uh, depending on what you use as, as a primary index. Uh, the second possibility is that you use a primary store map or something equivalent. Um, so JDBM2 does have a specialized internal mechanism for serializing longs. Uh, and uh, the distinction of store map, which is, uh, you can think of a store map as effectively being a heap. Uh, the distinction of it is that every uh, every tuple that you store in a primary store map is uh, uh, represented as, uh, sorry, is indexed by a long, uh, uh, a pointer, to the record ID of, of that record. And JDBM2 uh, has a somewhat more, uh, considerably more efficient way of serializing longs. Uh, so potential strategy two is that you just make all of your indexes unclustered and then use the, uh, use a primary store map, again, a heap, data structure as kind of your core representation. And this is presently what the reference implementation is doing. Uh, now, the kind of corollary to that is that by, you, by keeping the index, uh, the heap, sorry, by keeping your heap, your primary store map, uh, sorted in the right order, you're going to get 90% of the benefit of um, having a clustered index Anyway, so this potentially is going uh, is in my mind the best trade-off between uh, effort and uh, and performance. Uh, if you wanted to get really really fancy, what you could potentially do is implement a uh, your own secondary index infrastructure uh, by essentially creating uh, your own primary uh, so your own secondary indexes and kind of feeding them to JDBM2 as a, uh, a primary index, but that's uh, potentially going to be considerably more effort on your part. Um, so uh, I, would, I would not in, uh, initially try that approach. Yes? I have a couple questions. So are you saying we can't use secondary green maps? Uh, let me 
Um, so the question is, uh, am I suggesting that you not use secondary tree map? Uh, the suggestion is that if you do use secondary tree map, you use primary store map as your kind of primary index. So uh, if you use secondary tree map, there is going to be some level of inefficiency in the, the leaf pages of that, sec of that unclustered index. All of the pointers, uh, what you would think of as the pointers, are effectively keys in your primary index. And those pointers, uh, in most cases, are going to end up getting serialized uh, using Java's native serializer. And in general, uh, you probably don't want that. So the suggestion is, if you do use secondary tree map, your primary index, the, the primary index that the secondary is, is kind of branching off of or pointing to, should be a primary store map. Does that it? Mm -hmm. Yes, in the in the video. Yeah. yeah. Whenever I, um, I said um, with my primary tree map, I put a new row key, comma new row, whatever. Um, it, uh, it, it added that thing that you showed in the video that said like the class name. It added the class name and then the, the value. Yes. Uh, can I stop you? I just want to uh, make sure that I'm, I'm following you and make sure that uh, everyone else is following you. Uh, if I understand correctly, what you are saying is that you instantiated a row class, and the row class was getting stored in the serialized uh, copy that got put into the index. And then you subclassed row and stored the subclassed version in the, uh, in the index? Okay. And I did another class where I tried to take what I indexed and uh, grab, grab data using it. I see. Tuples based on the indexes. I see. And it wouldn't work because okay. in the other class it tacked on a different header. I see. Uh, so the, the question is, can you use two different class implementations uh, with the same serialized representation? And the answer is no. Um, if you have, the answer is no unless you use a, a custom serialization mechanism. So we have to build our indexes in the same class that we use the index? N uh, you do not need to build your indexes in the same class that you use the indexes, but the class that gets stored in the index needs to be the same class. So you can have one class that is common to all of your, one uh, representation class, or one uh, row class that is common to all of your, uh, you, all of the classes that use the index. Okay. Does that address your, your question? Okay. So I mean, basically, when it uh, when Java deserializes the object, it's going to deserialize exactly the same object that you stored in, and uh, you need to. Be if it's a different class that it's trying to deserialize, then it, it doesn't know what to do with that. Yeah. So if you. If you pull the row object out, like I did in the second video. Yeah. Yep. Have one class shared across all of your use cases. Okay. Any other any other questions on checkpoint three? All right. Um, so quick rundown of checkpoint four. A uh, formal version of this will be posted uh, later in the week. Uh, checkpoint four, basically add immutable data. Uh, the short version of this is uh, we'll be expecting 
support for insert, delete, and update statements. Um, the basic, the primary, the primary challenge here uh, is going to be uh, starting to consider uh, the trade-off between uh, maintaining an index and uh, using an index. So you'll, you'll be given a workload that includes not only queries, but also insert, delete, and update statements. And you'll be expected to uh, respond to the select statements um, you'll be expected to both update the data and uh, process the queries at the same time. So uh, first off, there's a trade-off between maintaining in indexes and using the indexes. Uh, and there are, we're expecting to see uh, at least a little bit of uh, complexity in terms of how the, uh, how the data representation is going to be maintained, how you're going to kind of represent the uh, data that is being uh, processed. Um, if you want to get really fancy on Checkpoint 4, you can also add concurrency, but the reference implementation will not be doing that. Any questions? Like I said, I'll have a more concrete version of this for you later in the week. All right, cool. So as I said last Wednesday, uh, the kind of next couple of lectures are basically going to be uh, up to you guys. So you guys called it, and uh, I'm going to teach it. Uh, as you can kind of see from uh, this, these statistics taken from Piazza, uh, the most popular thing by far was data warehousing, which we'll be covering today. Um, I see all 56 of you are here. Uh, the, the kind of second, the, the next most popular two subjects were uh, NoSQL databases and object relational databases. These are kind of, uh, oh, sorry, um, yeah, NoSQL databases and object relational databases. These are actually uh, fairly correlated topics and uh, they're also closely related to uh, hierarchical data. Um, so I'm uh, kind of going to try and take these three subjects uh, and, time permitting, uh, squeeze them into one lecture. Uh, sorry, two lectures. Uh, again, time permitting, uh, if I can actually pull that off, then uh, we'll move on to the next most popular subject, uh, online query processing. Uh, this is, of course, pending, uh, pending these things staying the same. So if anyone has any serious objections to these, uh, please contribute a vote because about half of the class has not done so yet. All right. Um, so that said, let's get into it. Um, data warehousing. So kind of this idea of data warehousing started way back when. Um, when people kind of realized, hey, we have lots and lots of different data sources. And you know, we might have, we've been creating these specialized database systems that can answer all of our questions, but we kind of have one database system that's managing some part of our data. We have another uh, database managing a different part of our data. Can we take all of these databases and kind of treat, integrate them all together, treat them as one really big uh, database that stores all of our data? The short answer is no. Um, basically, uh, many efforts have been made to kind of uh, create data warehouses. Um, and I think if you talk to people who have actually tried to create these massive uh, unified representations of lots of different databases, uh, this ends up being a really huge problem. And most of the time, trying to do that is uh, a horrible, horrible idea, be just because there's so many different factors that you need to deal with. So why even discuss it? Why, why bring up this uh, failed idea? Well, uh, it turns out that lots of the concepts that were developed, lots of the uh, ideas that people came up with, the design patterns, the, the techniques, that people came up with uh, to deal with these kinds of, ma again, massive uh, multi-source databases are actually uh, useful in lots of other cases. 
Um, plus, well, data warehouses have, were, were, yeah, are useful in lots of other cases. So today's lecture is basically going to be sort of a mishmash of different uh, techniques, different concepts that pertain to kind of building these massive uh, databases that you can uh, query. Uh, so first off, a little bit of a, a workflow uh, in, in a data warehouse, or what was conceptually supposed to be the workflow? Well, again, you have lots and lots of different data sources. And the idea is that you could take those data sources and come up with a way to merge all of those data sources into one common representation, a data warehouse. Once you have that one big data warehouse, you can start asking questions about it. And the two most popular classes of question that people have asked about used these, these kind of massive data repositories to answer uh, have been uh, traditionally things like uh, data mining. So uh, basically what Google does, what the NSA does. Uh, here's lots of data. What are some interesting patterns that I can find in this data? These kind of things where you don't know exactly what you're looking for, but you can kind of, uh, you kind of want to find out what's interesting in the data. And the other class of queries have been something called OLAP. Um, or online aggregation processing. And these are kind of uh, summarizations. I have a big, uh, I have this, this huge data set, and I'd like to know how uh, I can, I'd like to know kind of various characteristics of it. I'd like to get uh, various statistical metrics about different subsets of that data. And that's kind of what I'm going to focus on today mostly, this, this idea of uh, kind of asking these ag uh, queries that uh, summarize my data for me. And uh, I'm going to be talking about various techniques, various uh, processes that people have come up with to answer these queries efficiently. Uh, right. One other uh, comment on this, uh, this, if you'll note from this workflow, there's kind of this giant pre-processing stage where I take all of my data sources and kind of load them into the data warehouse. This is a real boon to us because it means that we can uh, do all of the pre-processing we want. And kind of the advantage of having a data warehouse is that we have, or the advantage of having this kind of big repository of data is that we're not necessarily uh, afraid to pre-compute a huge amount of things. Um, kind of like what you're doing with Checkpoint 3, except you don't have a limited amount of time to work with. You basically have all the time you need to do any kind of pre-computation uh, you want. I'm going to be using this term data warehouse to kind of refer to the various things that people kind of call data warehouses, not necessarily this giant unified uh, infrastructure. So, okay, uh, concretely, what is a data warehouse? It's uh, usually some subset of these things, but it's basically uh, what an ideal data warehouse would be is kind of this unified repository of all uh, of the data that, uh, that you happen to have. Uh, if you're a Citibank, you have lots of subsidiaries, you have lots of uh, clients, you have lots of divisions. Each of those divisions, clients, uh, subsidiaries has different uh, databases that they're using has different data sources. You want to basically have all of one consistent view of all of those. Uh, typically, these tend to these warehouses tend to be really big, uh, and they tend to feature these kind of uh, read-heavy workloads. Um, moreover, when we're asking questions about these huge data repositories. Uh, typically, kind of the, the interest is to get interactive or close to interactive response times. Uh, so I'm not necessarily just interested in getting uh, accurate results, but I'm, I'm basically interested in getting something fast. And for uh, data sizes that kind of can range into the petabytes, this is uh, typically very hard to do. Any questions at this point? 
All right. So, what kind of people? Uh, what ha what kind of problems have people faced when trying to construct these big giant repositories of multiple different uh, data sources? Uh, by the way, like I uh, like I keep saying. No one, I've, I've yet to see anyone actually pull off something that incorporates all of these things. But uh, there are kind of various partial uh, successes. Anyway, um, so what kind of challenges do people end up facing when uh, dealing with these massive data sets? Well, first off, if you're dealing with multiple different data sources, uh, these different data sources might represent data in different ways. Um, one database might have full name, one database might have first name, last name. Which data representation do I use? How do I discover that those two, uh, those two columns in the latter database correspond to the full name of uh, the former database? I need to be able. To, I need to have some way of mapping the the uh, schemas of these databases together. And even the data uh, might end up having different representations. Um, one database might have a person's first name as John. Another uh, database might have uh, the same person's name as Jonathan. These are conceptually the same entity, but they are represented or encoded in two different ways. So this kind of the the common name for this is the entity or schema uh, resolution problem because you have multiple entities, multiple schema elements, and they need to be uh, unified. Yes? Well, I don't understand why you, you couldn't have that problem on a single database. Oh, you could. It's just more pronounced in this case. Uh, the question was, uh, why doesn't this occur in single databases? And the answer is, it does. Uh, it's just, if you have multiple sources, this becomes even worse because every single source is going to encode things slightly differently. Yes? The question is, uh, are queries uh, in a data warehousing setting optimized for throughput as opposed to latency? Um, All right, well, the short answer is it depends. Uh, it depends on what kind of data warehouse you are building and what its purpose is. Uh, the class of data warehouse that I'm typically, that I'm going to focus on today, uh, and probably what I would consider to be one of the more prevalent classes of data warehouse, uh, is one that is targeted towards analysts, people who sit down and try and query the data and come up with uh, reasonable response, uh, summaries of, of the data. In that, kind of, in that kind of setting, you're probably going to be more interested in latency than throughput, because you're going to have far fewer people, a relatively small number of people trying to access the data. Um, moreover, because of the fact that the data is relatively static, unchanging, at least in this, uh, the setup that I'm presenting here, replication is a very easy way to get throughput. I can create two identical databases, and each of them is going to be serving exactly the same data. So I can, get, I can basically double my throughput pretty easily, whereas um, latency and response time is still kind of a, a, an issue. That said, there are cases where throughput, uh, examples of data warehouses where throughput uh, would be more relevant. Um, so more and more we're seeing uh, these kinds of uh, kind of custom analytics uh, in the cloud kind of infrastructures. Uh, so uh, there's a number of these analytics firms uh, Flurry is the one that comes to mind, but there's a, a handful of them that essentially provide uh, logging functionality and then uh, allow you to analyze the data after. Uh, Google Analytics, what am I saying? Google Analytics, uh, Flurry, uh, there's a number of these. Uh, in that case, where 
you're essentially creating this, this giant data warehouse. Uh, you could view the, the, the kind of analytics data that they're gathering as a form of data warehouse. And in that case, uh, if you're kind of serving this data warehouse uh, to lots and lots of users, throughput becomes an issue. But at the same time, you kind of want to preserve latency because, again, these are, these are human beings sitting down trying to analyze the data. So, I mean, it, it, like I said, it, it depends on what you're trying to go for. But because a human is interacting with the data, latency is keeping the latency to a kind of interactive rate is probably more, in my mind, more important. Um, that is a, a use case, and it, actually one, one thing that comes to mind, um, Amadeus in uh, basically the, the European equivalent of Expedia has a, uh, recently had uh, this uh, paper where they discussed one of their uh, kind of warehousing infrastructures, and in that case, uh, they do need to run these kind of regular uh, batch processed analytics queries to kind of figure out um, kind of strategic planning for the next uh, time period, uh, whatever that time period may be. Uh, advertising companies also have this issue where you kind of have a huge amount of data. You basically run the same exact analytics queries on a daily basis to figure out where things are going basically pre-process this, figure out what the statistics for the previous day are so that you can decide how to move on. In that case, yes, throughput would be uh, a major issue uh, for that kind of workload. Um, and it, you're right, it, it is a fairly common one. Um, like I said, today I'm mostly focusing on ways of increasing, um, making these, interact, uh, these warehouses in, operate at interactive speeds. Okay, uh, right. So you have these uh, multiple sources. Uh, because of the fact that you have multiple sources, the data may be stored in different ways. Uh, you might have one uh, data source uh, stored in an indexed form, which is amenable to certain kind, uh, kinds of scans. You might have a different data source that is just a really big table, uh, sorry, a really big data file uh, that has to be parsed in and that is just, um, that has a much narrower way, a uh, set of access paths available. What's worse is that these, uh, or uh, another example would be uh, forms. If you have to access a data set through a web form, then, or, or uh, kind of an online API, that's yet another different way, uh, access path that you have to, to the data with its own set of restrictions and limitations. Uh, and kind of the big difficulty and one of the, the major things to come out of this is this observation that you have, um, in order to keep latencies low, there is a huge advantage in kind of loading the data into a standardized form. Uh, bring all of the data that you have in, importing it into the database, importing it into uh, HDFS if you're using MapReduce, importing it into some sort of infrastructure uh, that you can use to kind of uh, improve the performance. And this includes indexing, this includes uh, data cleaning, uh, and all of kind of the pre-processing that you typically need to do to bring something into an infrastructure. Uh, this is typically referred to as uh, this kind of pre-processing stage is typically referred to as extract, take the data and get the useful bits out of it, uh, transform, restructure it and clean it and basically put it into uh, some sort of uh, representation that you're happy to work with and analyze, and then load, uh, which you know, 
basically indexing and building all of your, your metadata over it. So extract, transform, and load. And finally, uh, there's this question of metadata. Where did, where did the data come from? How did, um, if I'm going through this process, I'd like to know uh, the origins or uh, what's called provenance of my data so that I can, uh, if I see some errors in my query results, I can tra uh, trace it back to kind of the root causes. Uh, and I'd like my query processing uh, to keep that prov or keep track of that provenance. Was there a question? So provenance is kind of its own lecture, and most of these are uh, kind of their own uh, l lectures in and of themselves. What I'm going to focus on initially is this um, kind of the, the representation of the data. Uh, what are some tricks that we can use uh, to represent the data in such a way that we can uh, access it efficiently? So as with all representations, we need some kind of formalism to start with. We need uh, to kind of have a way that we can think about the data that makes it uh, amenable to uh, low latency querying in this case. So we're going to start out with this uh, representation called MOLAP, uh, or multidimensional uh, online aggregation processing. And the two terms I want you to take away from this are uh, dimension and value attribute. So if I have some table, I can think of that table as uh, encoding both a set of coordinates and a set of values. So in this case, I have, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, product ID, uh, location ID, so like a, a where, which warehouse uh, is currently storing these products, and a time ID. So a point in time when a concrete measurement was taken. So given a product ID, given a time ID, and given a location ID, a key essentially for this table, that identifies a specific value. There's a functional mapping from those three attributes to a single, uh, to a single data point. And what does that mean? That means we can kind of think of this as a three-dimensional table, a three-dimensional uh, space. One dimension is product, one dimension is time, one dimension is location. I have three different coordinates. Those three different coordinates give me a specific value. I can also have more dimensions, or I can have fewer dimensions. But this kind of, this gives us a starting point for describing uh, and talking about aggregation. Any, any questions on this? This idea of multiple dimensions corresponding to a single attribute, or mapping to a single attribute. Okay. So one kind of data representation is this where we have all of our, each dimension kind of represents one attribute in the table. Now, what the, one of the problems that we'll run into in this case is what happens when a dimension has more uh, context associated with it. So in this case, I have, for example, product ID. Now, you guys have seen TPCH. It's got this part ID table. What if I wanted to pick out all of the parts that were red? In this particular model, how would I, where would I store red? Or what, what would red be? Okay, it would be an attribute. Uh, we got two types, two types of attributes, dimension or value. What kind would it be? Hmm? Value. So a particular part maps to a particular color, but here we have uh, kind of measurements, uh, number of sales at a given location 
um, for a given part. So there's a functional mapping from part ID to part, but would it be fair to call it a value? So in a sense, the, the color is something, is a, something that kind of leads to the sales. It's, uh, you, you can have, um, if we're interested in the set of uh, the, how do I put this? So the, the distinction is that the, the value attributes in, uh, in a MOLAP table, the values are basically things that we can kind of gather statistics over. Sales, for example, I can compute an average set of sales. I can compute a sum of sales, standard deviation. I can't really do that with red. So in this case, so red would kind of be a property that uh, not necessarily provides a, a functional dependency to sales, but a, a property that kind, that kind of maps to sales. Some, something that might appear in a selection predicate might be another way of phrasing it. It is, however, a, prop, uh, a property associated with uh, the uh, part ID. So you don't necessarily want to have this one big table with a column red in every single row, or a column defining color in every single row, because if I know the part ID, I know the color. We talked about this with uh, the normal forms. So another common design pattern in data warehouses is this idea of uh, a fact table, um, or more precisely, a star schema. So if you think of TPCH, TPCH has this, uh, has this line item table. And the line item table is this really ginormous table that has kind of pointers going out to other different, uh, to other different tables, uh, to orders, another going out to part, another going out to supplier, uh, and so forth. In each of these uh, dimension, uh, you can think of these uh, as each representing one of the dimensions of that table. So in this star schema design pattern, this fact table design pattern, you basically have this one big table with lots of pointers going out to smaller tables uh, describing each dimension. And the dimensions kind of concretely describe specific properties uh, of each instance of, of one of these dimensions. They kind of allow you to associate multiple uh, kind of hier hierarchical elements with, uh, with a dimension. So as before, I have this fact table that stores a part ID, uh, a time ID, and a location ID, maps those to a particular sales count. And now I also have a set of dimension tables supporting that. And those dimension tables provide data that is associated with the, uh, with the individual dimensions that kind of get uh, defined in, or used in the sales table. So if I wanted all of the uh, I don't have color in here, but if I wanted all of the red parts, I could first find the set of red parts and then pick out the appropriate rows for my fact table. And this kind of uh, representation is very, very common in OLAP workloads. One additional note on this the fact table usually gets added to very frequently, whereas the dimension tables usually stay very consistent. They're kind of descriptors for individual uh, values. OK. Um, so we have our data models. Now, OLAP queries, these kind of uh, analytics processing uh, 
workloads typically involve um, Actually, let me back up a little bit. Both of these, these models that I just described are kind of organized around a single centralized uh, view of, of the data, this fact table. And if you think about that, it looks very much like a spreadsheet. You've got this one table, a bunch of rows of data, and a bunch of columns kind of describing uh, the properties of that data. And this is kind of where uh, this kind of OLAP query processing got its start, this spreadsheet idea. And a lot of the kind of tasks that are typical of OLAP queries kind of originated with various things that people started doing with spreadsheets. Kind of the, the big thing in that case is aggregation. So for example, if I have this table of uh, sales data, I might want to find the total sales, or I might want to find the total sales aggregated by some grouping function. Now, in spreadsheets and business, this, uh, there are kind of some buzzwords that arise. Um, and these buzzwords have been kind of uh, taken by the, the OLAP uh, workload research direction. Uh, so I want to define a couple of these for you. So the first, <clears throat> I have this, this big spreadsheet of data. I'd like to be able to kind of uh, view it at a, a finer granularity. And I'd like to kind of zoom in on, on specific properties or if the, the data that I'm looking at needs to be summarized, I'd like to be able to kind of aggregate it and, and summarize it in various forms. Uh, terms that you'll commonly hear in this context are things like drill down and roll up. Uh, so roll up basically means that I have, I have a very aggregated view of the data. You can think of this as a view of the data that has a very small number of groups. And I'd like to be able to move to a fi uh, sorry a coarser grained a coarser uh, grained view of the data uh, uh, by kind of reducing the number the total number of groups essentially removing uh, removing group by columns drill down I have a really coarse grained view sorry. Um, for roll up, uh, I have a, a fine grained view, uh, lots of precision, lots of, uh, lots of groups, and I'd like to be able to kind of aggregate those together. So roll up basically means reduce the number of groups by reducing the number of columns. And to drill down basically is the opposite of that. Um, I have lots and lots of group, sorry, I have a small number of groups, and I'd like to be able to uh, reduce the uh, amount of groups that I have. And this kind of, uh, there's a lot of uh, how about this? So certain analytics packages have this ability to present the data to you in this kind of summarized form. And in most of these systems, what they'll do is allow you to kind of change the view of the data dynamically. I have uh, a certain set, uh, a certain query with a certain set of group by attributes and they'll allow you to kind of intuitively add or remove groups, zooming, uh, rolling up or drilling down, as the case may be. Uh, two other kind of operations on these uh, summarized tables uh, are known as pivoting and slice and dice. So slice and dice basically means, it's another way of saying select. I'd like to pick out a set of rows that I'm interested in. And pivoting means to kind of build this, this sort of cross tabulation that you see here uh, that shows both the total for uh, two different dimensions and then uh, a final aggregate over all dimensions. Any questions up to this point? Or have I lost everyone? Four main terms, roll up, drill down, pivot, and slice and dice. More groups, fewer groups, 
select and aggregate. OK. Um, these four operations form kind of the basis of uh, what maybe five years ago was, was kind of the main way of inter uh, interacting with very large data sets, these very large fact tables. Still fairly commonly used as a first pass analytics uh, view, although people have kind of moved on to other things uh, to varying degrees. So um, these kind of four operators allow me to change my current view of th these four behaviors, uh, uh, four functions, allow me to change my current view of the data uh, by picking out certain rows, by changing the, the granularity at which I'm representing it. So a natural question arises, how do I do this efficiently? How do I implement these four operators uh, in a in a way that kind of provides the, the low latency response times that my end users are expecting to see. So if we're answering this, this kind of question, how, uh, well, where do we start? One logical place may be something that we're already familiar with, uh, SQL queries. So these kind of cross tabulations, uh, bring that back. How could you express this, this kind of query, uh, this kind of uh, cross tabulation as a SQL query? Let me make it a little bit easier. Could you express individual parts of this cross tabulation as SQL queries? So, okay, each of these individual parts, I could. Uh, so, what about this this central part here? I have some data that has two dimension attributes. So, uh, state, New York, Washington, and year, a bunch of years, uh, and then a value for each of those uh, for each of those pairs. I have six rows. Okay, so this could be potentially represented as a group by query. Some group by year. This is the base data right here, and that's some group by state. And then that's just some with no group bys. So this is conceptually four different SQL queries. Query one, query two, query three, and query four. Moreover, the uh, schema of these is, they're all kind of subsets of the same base schema, state, year, value. So I've got, here I've got state, year, and value, here I've got year and value, here I've got state and value, here I've got just value. Okay. So I could potentially express each of those as a SQL query. Now let me generalize, let's back up a little. Um, if I had n different attributes, how many different queries could I create over n different dimension attributes? So in that case, I had two attributes, and I got three query, uh, four queries out of it. Let's say I have, what is that, state, let's say I, let's say I have that table. How many different uh, queries could I create over that? Previously, I had 
group by state, uh, sorry, group by state and year, group by state, group by year, and group by nothing. Eight queries, and how did you get that? Okay, so for every dimension attribute, that attribute is either part of, part of, or not part of the query. Boolean decision for each attribute, three attributes, two to the eighth, it's, uh, sorry, two to the uh, third, eight queries. Okay. Now let's say we wanted to be able to quickly move between these different levels of aggregation. I start with state year part, and I want to be able to quickly jump down to just state and year. And then let's say I want to be able to quickly pick out some subset of the rows, and then just for those rows, pick out, uh, or just for those rows, aggregate by state. That's a sequence of, uh, that's a sequence of roll up operators followed by a slice and dice to pick out a subset of the rows, select. What would I need to do to perform that efficiently? What are you doing for checkpoint three? Hmm? Indexes, okay, I could build an index. More generally, what, or what would I index if I was doing that? Keys, so all three keys, would I build three different indexes? Would I build, what would I build? Three different indexes. Okay, so I could build one index over this, one index over this, one index over this. Okay, so that gets me part of the way. I can, I can do selection efficiently that way. Can I do aggregation efficiently that way? So let's say I wanted to roll everything up into a single sum term. I'd need to iterate over the entire table. In fact, for any kind of aggregate I wanted to compute, I'd have to iterate over the entire table. So what else might it make sense to do in addition to indexing? Well, if you have a huge amount of time to, to play with. Hmm? Okay, you could cluster the data, but again, that's still organization. So you know you're going to have to support all of the, ag uh, well, you, you're, you know you're going to have to support some subset of, of the possible sets of aggregations. Why not just compute all of them? Compute every single possible aggregation, aggregate by state, aggr by, aggregate by state and year, aggregate by just year, state year in part, just year in part, all eight different possible aggregates, can I compute them all? Well, I have all of the space, I have, when you say data warehouse, what comes to mind is this huge repository of data. I have all the storage space I could possibly want. I have all the time, the pre-computation time that I could possibly want. Why not use it? Pre-compute everything. Only a fraction of those are actually going to end up getting used, but yeah, that's potentially fine if I have all of the pre-computation time that I could possibly want. So, uh, what, is this, uh, what does this boil down to? This boils down to an operator in, uh, an operator in the SQL standard called cube. And the cube operator basically does exactly what I just described. You give it a set of group by terms and it computes all of them. It materializes all of them. Um, 
And this allows you to basically pre-build this kind of data cube data structure, which allows you to support these kinds of queries uh, more efficiently. So could I represent the output of all of these queries in a single table? What would be stopping me from representing them if, if I can't? So there's more, uh, what do you mean by there's more than three dimensions? Okay, so the schema of each relation is different. But I said that the schema, all of the schemas are subsets of the same core schema. So when it, what ends up happening in uh, the cube operator is that any, it, it's going to create this one big table with the same parent schema as the input. But every attribute that is kind of ignored is going to end up being set to null. So it's going to uh, select state, sorry, group by state, year equals null, part equals null. Simultaneously, it's going to compute uh, state and year, group by state and year, or select. Uh, ah. uh, doo -doo -doo. So that's one instance, just null as year. And it's going to do all of these, and it's going to union all of them together and create this one big table that represents the full cross-tabulation of the entire uh, relation. Now, this is kind of an expensive operation, um, but there are some various tricks that you can use uh, to implement it efficiently. And if you're, if you're interested in this, um, there is a very nice paper on data cubes by uh, the great Jim Gray. Um, so I encourage you to look, uh, look into that if you're interested. All right, uh, let's actually skip over that. We're running short, so all right. Let's take a very brief, um, a very brief pause, uh, and come back at uh, six oh five. All right, let's move on. So there's two more things I'd like to cover, uh, both kind of also tangentially related to data warehouses. And the first is this observation that if you have lots of time to pre-process your data, lots of time to kind of organize it the way that you, uh, you like. Uh, and particularly if you're going to be doing lots and lots of selection on your tables, there's potentially better ways uh, to represent your data. Now this is kind of a full lecture's worth of content here that I'm going to summarize in about three slides. Uh, but kind of the, I'm going to try and give you an intuition uh, for what, what are called column stores. So a, column, uh, a traditional database is going to store data organized by rows. If I, uh, I have an object that represents an entire row worth of data. Um, many of you have probably done something similar in your uh, implementations. In a column store, what happens instead is that the data is organized by column. I have a file on disk that stores for every row, a row identifier, and then the value in that column. Now this allows me to do all sorts of crazy things, like, for example, to uh, 
to sort all of the data in some sort of uh, column independent way. Uh, so for example, let's see if this works. Oh, no, it's supposed to um, animate that. Anyway, uh, so if my data is, uh, what I can do in a column store is essentially optimize the representation of each column independently. And if it makes sense to sort uh, one uh, column in a particular order, I can sort that column in that particular order. Uh, if these are numerical values or date values, I can sort each column in terms of the date values or the number values uh, that are getting stored in there. Then, when I want to do a selection over this data, it's much easier to do it because the data is already sorted. This is effectively kind of fodder for B tree style or um, B tree or, or um, uh, what should we call it? Uh, binary search uh, kind of scans through the data. I can do that. And then I get back for every column a set of row identifiers for every single row that satisfies that particular part of the predicate. In this case, I have a set of rows that satisfy A, a set of rows that satisfy B, and so forth. Then, in order to compute the, uh, the kind of aggregate value, all I need to do is compute an intersection of those row identifiers. And in this particular query, only uh, row 1 appears in every single one of these sets. This has a number of advantages. First off, again, I can sort each row independently. And if my selection predicates are kind of very selective, which most of them are, this kind of intersection can be computed very, very efficiently. And moreover, if I have lots and lots of different columns, I only need to load the specific columns that I'm interested in. All right. That's the whirlwind tour through column databases. Uh, you guys didn't want a full lecture on it, but here it is. Any questions? Yes. To reconstruct the original table? So you have two, uh, you're asking if you can store individual columns on different databases or conceptually have two different databases, each storing a subset of the columns of the overall table that you're interested in? Uh, yeah, so uh, I mean, you could certainly characterize multiple columns from different databases on, uh, or as a form of column store. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure what the main, uh, the main, the difficulty there would be figuring out which rows correspond to one another. If you have rows in one database and rows in another database, you'd have to have some sort of join attribute that kind of signifies which, which rows in one database correspond to one, which rows in another database. Uh, but in effect, the original table here, the, the original table is just Thank you. The original table is just uh, is just the join of these kind of individual columns. And in your case, the original, like the full table, would be the join of the data stored in each individual database. Um, the only observation here is that you can, by decomposing the individual columns of a full table, you can do kind of all sorts of optimizations that are uh, 
that apply to individual columns, like sorting every uh, row in the column uh, in a way that's different from the way that you sort a different column. Uh, or another common thing is run length encoding. So if I have uh, 50 different records that all store, uh, that all are, um, correspond to red parts, all I need to do is store the row identifiers of each of those records. Uh, I mean, this, this is just a, a, it's an optimization over the basic way of storing data, and it's one that people have created really, really efficient databases for, or really, really efficient uh, database, uh, databases that are really, really efficient for specific workloads. Does that kind of, I know that's not a direct answer to your question, but okay. any other questions? Yes. You could indeed think of this as creating multiple indexes uh, or one index for each individual column. Uh, the main distinction is that uh, you don't need to maintain the indexes separately. And uh, these are typically not going to be indexed per se as much as they're going to be stored sorted, um, which is a common implementation of a column store is uh, as an in-memory database where building an index is potentially a little bit less useful because of um, an index essentially devolves to uh, binary search anyway, the performance of binary search. No. Uh, in this case, if you have four columns, you have four, uh, four separate columns. And in order to reconstruct the original table, you need to join those four columns together. Nothing gets duplicated except for the row ID. Um, let me, to use uh, the previous example, To use my previous example, we'd add a row identifier to every row and have one column represent or one table conceptually representing the state column, one table representing the year column, one and so forth, and to reconstruct the the overall sales table. I'd, I'd have to perform this kind of join to join all of the rows together. But the observation is, if, my, if I'm going to be running selection predicates on individual columns, which is a common thing in OLAP, it's pretty much the only kind of uh, thing that gets done in uh, TPCH, then I can push my selection predicates all the way down to the individual tables. And if those predicates are selective enough, then I can be very, very efficient about, uh, I can kind of run each of those selection operators independently, and I don't have to load in all of the data at once. It's kind of like having lots of index paths over. Yes? Ah, uh, yes, uh, so this is, the, the main downside to this approach is that it's very difficult to modify the data or to add data more precisely. Um, especially if all of your records are going to be stored in sorted order, which is kind of the, one of the major benefits of, of this kind of approach, uh, then incorporating new data into this 
is going to be expensive because you basically have to reorder uh, or insert new values into multiple sorted lists. Uh, the second difficulty is when your query workload frequently accesses multiple columns or lots of columns. So if you have four columns and your query workload always accesses all of them, or your, your selection predicates, join predicates, always access all of those columns, this is typically a bad idea because you don't really get quite as much benefit from it. Um, the main advantages are that you load less data because you don't necessarily need to load all of your columns in and that you can kind of push your selection predicates down and take advantage of things like uh, sorted order uh, or uh, run length encoding over your data to kind of deal with less data. Um, that's more or less the main advantage. And if you don't get that main advantage, then you're basically paying the overhead of joining all of your columns together after the fact. Many database systems, in fact. Uh, so Oracle recently released a feature that will do exactly what you just said. Um, actually, they do everything. They store it as a column store in memory in addition to storing it uh, on disk as a row store. Uh, yeah, I mean, this, this is a, a re purely a representation issue. And uh, while... It's kind of slow going to get this integrated into uh, sort of major, like the big four database systems. Uh, there are systems like IBM, uh, like Vertica, uh, sorry, HP's uh, Vertica. Um, Michael Stonebreaker has like a bajillion of these uh, implementations as well uh, that kind of do this kind of hybrid representation of your tables. Um, I don't know if that answers your question specifically, but yes, you can. Any others? All right. Uh, it is uh, six twenty. I unfortunately will not have time to get into uh, MapReduce. I encourage you to ask at least a few questions about that if uh, you're interested. But with that. Um, See everyone on Wednesday where we'll be talking about NoSQL and or hierarchical data. <laughs>